Hello again to uh, ESC Congress 2025. This is day two, and I'm here with Farid Shabi at Radcliffe Cardiology to go over the updates and hotlines from the second day. Farid, I know there was some exciting stuff when it came to obstructive cardiomyopathy. Want to tell us a little bit about some of these trials? Yeah, there are actually two trials that uh, address the use of uh, cardiac myosin inhibitors in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The first one addressed uh, uh, the use of uh, afikantan uh, in obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, comparing it to the gold standard that is the, uh, in the guidelines, which is the use of uh, beta blockers, metoprolol. So this was a uh, direct randomized trial between the uh, cardiac myosin inhibitor afikantan and the standard of care that's currently present in the guidelines, which is metoprolol. The primary endpoint was exercise capacity as measured by peak VO2, with the secondary endpoints being symptoms as assessed by the uh, QCCQ score, as well as the Valsalva LVOT gradient and uh, biomarkers NT pro BNP. Now, in the results of 24 weeks of treatment, afikantan monotherapy was superior to the gold standard metoprolol with a statistically significant reduction in clinically meaningful improvements, both in the primary endpoint as assessed by improved exercise capacity using uh, VO2 consumption, as well as improvement in secondary endpoints, including the key CCQ score, as well as a reduction in the Valsalva LVOT gradient and reductions in DP were brilliant BNP. In fact, it was clearly superior to metoprolol. The, the, the drug was also extremely well to tolerated. And uh, the conclusion of the authors, I think, will, will be something that the uh, guideline writers will need to take up in the next revision of guidelines will be that the alfikantan may, well, may well be the monotherapy potential first-line treatment therapy of choice in place of uh, of the current gold stab of metoprolol. So I think this was a very interesting, positive result for the, cardi uh, the cardiac myosin inhibitors. Well, the second uh, trial that was presented with the cardiac myosin inhibitors in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was addressed to uh, was, uh, the use of uh, uh, Mavicantam, uh, which is already approved for the use in obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a class 1 indication. It looked at the use of this drug versus uh, uh, placebo in patients with non-obstructive hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. And again, the primary endpoints were exercise capacity as measured by peak oxygen consumption as well as quality of life measured by the QCCQ score. Safety endpoints as well were reduction in EF as well as MACE cardiovascular death and non-fatal infarctions. And unfortunately, this result was negative. So there's really no difference between Mavicantan and placebo, uh, whether it is related to the primary endpoint or any of the secondary endpoints. Furthermore, there was a slight safety concern raised. Uh, in about 20% of patients randomized to Mavicantan, there was a reduction in EF to below 50%, and in a much smaller percentage of patients, a reduction in EF to below 30%, although these were reversible upon discontinuation of the drug. So a negative study for the use of cardiac myosin inhibitors in non-obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Be interesting how the results of these trials will impact guidelines, um, particularly when it comes to someone like you and me who are interventional cardiologists and the current options are you know, um, either a surgical or transcatheter ablation of the septum in patients with obstructive disease, and whether Mavacampton now is going to be um, upgraded over an invasive procedure for these symptomatic obstructive patients. Now we have two drugs, two cardiac myosin inhibitors that have proven their effectiveness in obstructive cardiomyopathy, both Mavacampton and Afikampton. So moving on to beta blockers, you know, beta blockers are uh, age-old drugs that we've been using, particularly post-myocardial infarction, and some an interesting data came out today. The first one was the uh, beta-MI um, down-block trial that really was conducted. It was a randomized trial that was conducted in both Norway and Denmark, included over 5,500 patients who had an ejection fraction of more than 40% in a recent myocardial infarction. They were able to follow up these patients for over three and a half years and were 95% of them were placed on oral metoprolol. And they followed them up. The results were adjudicated, fortunately. 
and the primary endpoint was really a composite of all cause mortality and major adverse cardiovascular events. It included ischemic stroke, reinfarction, heart failure, and malignant uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So what they were able to demonstrate is that long-term beta blockers started within 14 days of a myocardial infarction in patients who have an ejection fraction above 40%, but below 50%, so mildly uh, impaired. And it was consistent across all subgroups when they did evaluate them, was that it was able to lower the risk of death or major cardiovascular events. And it was actually the superiority design also proved that these drugs should be continued in our patients. Along the same lines, the reboot trial, this was slightly larger, over 8,500 patients were enrolled. Again, these are patients who did not have severely depressed LV. Their EF was about 45% following a myocardial infarction, and they were randomized to a beta blocker versus a placebo and followed up again for over three and a half years, approximately four years. And the end primary endpoint was, again, a composite of death from any cause, heart failure, hospitalizations, and reinfarctions. Now, unfortunately, in this particular trial, they did not find that beta blockers had an impact on the primary endpoint. Interestingly, the investigators, what they ended up doing is they ended up getting data, pooling data from others, from the Batami Dam block as well as the Capital RCT. And when they did that, there was a, and they evaluated patients with slightly reduced uh, function. What they did notice is that there was some improvement in certain categories particularly in patients who had an ejection fraction less than 40% or 40 to 49%. Interestingly, women had no benefits in this particular study. So at least they went through the exercise of looking at subgroup analyses in these trials. How's that going to change your practice, Khaled? Uh, I'm from a, a real cardiologist who sort of old school and uh, I've always used and continue to use beta blocks. So I think today's beta blocker studies and yesterday's digoxin study go back and reassess uh, traditional medications that we've used and to a large degree have sort of confirmed uh, the benefit of these medications in those scenarios. Although over the years there have been doubts raised about them, I think this sort of uh, reinforces uh, the uh, uh, old uh, the concepts of the doctrine does have a role and beta blockers certainly do have a role post their mind. You know, another uh, slight shift in gears here, we were talking about triglycerides earlier today and uh, the ESSENCE trial, TIMI 73B was presented and this looked at patients who had moderate hypertriglyceridemia and severe hypertriglyceridemia with a cutoff of 500 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And they were, uh, it's a randomized trial where they were given the subcutaneous injection every four weeks, either at a dose of 40 milligrams or 80 milligrams against placebo. And in patients with moderate um, hypertriglyceridemia, but with high cardiovascular risk, it did in fact reduce by 60% the level of triglycerides. And it was similar in both doses. So that was interesting as well. Um, there was a 70% reduction in the remnant triglycerides, significant reduction in ApoB, and no major um, you know, safety concerns. It was really ax uh, injection site uh, irritation and so on that were evaluated. So they really do support both the safety and efficacy of olizarsan for patients with uh, triglyceridemia. And I think we finally have an agent that we could potentially uh, add to our armamentarium for these patients. I think there's probably one more study that is worth mentioning from this morning, which was, again, I think it reinforces practice patterns that are already established. And that was the DAPA-ACT heart failure TB68 study that looked at the use of dapa -tliflosin which is already established in the guidelines uh, in the treatment of heart failure, irrespective of EF, both preserved, moderate use, or reduced EF. So it looked at the benefit of, of using dapagliflozin in the initial hospitalization uh, for uh, acutely compensated uh, heart failure. Now, it was a negative study, but uh, that needs to be qualified with the fact that uh, a, the uh, event rate was much lower than expected, and uh, more importantly, maybe, that the follow-up uh, period was restricted to two months. Now, they didn't want to follow these patients, randomizing DAP against placebo, for more than two months, because there is obviously the ethical concern that you're withholding an effective guideline-directed therapy for these from patients, potentially, for an extended period of time. So they, so they cut off at two months, uh, and that's probably one of the reasons that 
the study was negative, but they then they combined it with two other studies that looked at the same idea. And again, it's really reinforced the fact that dapagliflozin is safe and uh, for all uh, levels of heart failure, irrespective of EF, and could be safely started uh, during the reference hospitalization. I think that that's something that a lot of us were doing anyway, but now we have the evidence for it. I mean, it's practical and convenient both for the physicians and the patients. Um, and what you mentioned about, you know, when, when these trials are not powered enough to get pooled data in order to get the results that are necessary to inform uh, practice, is, is we're seeing it more often now in these trials. And before we end today, there was a trial that was a little difficult to interpret, I must admit, but it was the um, Dan Canvas 2 trial. Now, this was a trial that looked at CT scan screening of patients with the hope that based on the CT scan, intervention would prevent cardiovascular events and even death. They, it was primarily done in men who were between the ages of 60 and 64. They uh, included over 30,000 patients here. Um, and they were either invited to have a comprehensive CT evaluation and then started on preventive therapies, including statins and aspirin and, um, you know, evaluation for aneurysms and so on. The primary eye outcome in terms of cardiovascular event rates and death was actually 0.9% in those with an absolute uh, reduction in mortality, 17% relative risk reduction. The composite of cardiovascular mortality, stroke, MI, there was no difference detected there. And in terms of safety, there was a 1.4% absolute increase in major bleeding. Remember, these patients did receive aspirin as a preventive therapy, a 37% relative increase. So with seven years of follow-up, there was unfortunately no significant relative risk uh, reduction in the observed in these uh, category of patients. More than that, the adherence to the protocol where these patients actually came to the follow-up, adhered to the aspirin therapy, for example, was also considered low. Only one-third of, pa one of the patient did not even attend their screening. That is a substantial number, I would say, in a large preventive trial. And one-third of those with subclinical cardiovascular disease uh, events did not adhere to statins and or aspirin therapy. So. You know, conclusions here are a little difficult to make with that. I, I, would, I would probably predict it that we already have problems with our patients adhering to statin therapies after having major cardiovascular events. But it may be even more difficult to convince somebody who has not had an event uh, just on the basis of primary prevention to adhere. And I think that was reflected in the core adherence uh, uh, to therapy. Absolutely. I'm just wondering how CT scan now is going to fall into the algorithm of prevention, particularly because we have currently plenty of robust data that shows the power of cardiac CT to identify plaque and, and uh, risk stratify patients who have not had event rates just yet. So thank you everyone for joining us in day two. Plenty more for day three.